the phrase of the day is progressive revelation. And when you hear that, I don't want you to think, uh, you know, progressive versus conservative or something like that. Uh, what we're talking about here is a very technical term. And what this means is that God slowly reveals more of his plan over time. So as you read through this section, uh, what are some key subjects we know very little about here in Genesis, but we'll know far more about from the rest of scripture. All right. So the way that God works with his revelation, the way that he's revealed this anyways in his Bible, is that God uh, makes certain things known slowly and over time. And so when especially it comes to the idea of understanding the gospel, what people knew about the gospel, what God directly revealed about the gospel 4,000 years ago is very different than what we know now. Because over that 4,000 year period, God has revealed more and more about his gospel plans up into the very actual historical event of, of meeting all of those promises. But at the very beginning here, what we need to imagine when we are considering Adam and Eve is we have to imagine we don't know anything about the Bible. We need to be able to put ourselves in Adam and Eve's shoes if they were wearing shoes and, uh, and imagine that they don't know anything about God's plans for Jesus. They don't know anything about uh, all that kind of stuff. They don't have any of Paul's very clear teachings on things. They come with a completely blank slate and we're going to watch then how God responds to them and what he says to them. And we're going to try to see what we can, what we can put together based on what he says to them. All right. So we're going to begin in the garden of Eden. And so Genesis one is, is the account of the creation of the world. And it's the account of God creating the world in six days, Genesis chapter two, then the writer zeroes in on day six, and that's where we get this beautiful creation of man and woman. Um, chapter one uh, mentions right away that both man and woman, they're created in the image of God. And that phrase, image of God, if you read the rest of scripture and the way that that term is used, image of God, there's uh, two kind of ideas to this. Uh, but the main kind of solid one is this idea that Adam and Eve were created morally perfect. Like God, they, uh, they could do good things, right? They could worship God and do uh, holy things and holiness in God's presence. And they could choose to do this on their own. The rest of creation, other animals, they don't make moral choices in any way, shape, or form. Adam and Eve were created with this ability. They were created with the ability to worship God and to serve him willfully. And so they were created with that image. And chapter two then of Genesis gives us then how then God created Adam and Eve in more detail, shows how uh, Adam and Eve were created in a, in a complementary sense for each other uh, to fill each other's needs. Uh, the very first words that we have spoken in the Bible by a human being is a love poem from Adam to his wife saying, you know, this, you know, you are bone of my bone, uh, flesh of my flesh, right? This, this beautiful imagery of the closeness between Adam and Eve. And so at the end of chapter two, we're left with Adam and Eve, the very first man and woman, husband and wife, uh, created perfectly to complement each other in a perfect world at this point. And then all of a sudden, chapter three, things take a very strange turn. And that's where we're going to pick things up. So in chapter three, it begins with these words. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from, eat from any tree in the garden? So in chapter two, what we learn is that God created Adam and Eve, placed them in a garden. And in that garden, there were two trees. One was the tree of life. The other was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God told Adam and Eve, you cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything else on this planet, you can, you can explore, you can, uh, you can discover, you can use, um, you can enjoy, but just don't eat from this tree from the knowledge of good and evil. That's, that's my one prohibition. And so here we've got the woman, uh, we've got the serpent saying to Eve, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, you got that a little wrong. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say 
you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. That is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So just kind of looking at uh, these very first words here that we've got. So at first glance, it looks as if the serpent's goal is simply to get Eve to eat some fruit. And we might be asking ourselves, what's so bad about that? But just think a little bit more deeply here. What's actually going on? What's the serpent really trying to get Eve to do? Um, I feel the fundamental thing is, it's Rose, um, that it's that jealousy. I, I have a right to have as much knowledge as God. So you're, you're being kept from something you deserve. Okay, so, so Satan is saying to Adam and Eve, um, God's holding something back from you. Is that what you're saying? And what he's holding back from you is, is this knowledge. Okay, Correct. good, good. What else? Pastor, I think it's, um, he's, he's really just trying to get them to, to uh, disobey God. Yeah, how's he going about doing it though? Well, he's... What? Yeah, he's leading up to it. He's being sneaky. He's giving misinformation initially mm -hmm. and then wrapping that into if it's okay to eat from that tree or all the other trees, you can eat from this one as well. Yeah. Good. Good. I think, I think that he's trying to get them to question God or to question God's love and concern for them. Where do you see that, Lee? Um, because he says, well, did, did God really say you couldn't eat from the tree and, and you won't surely die. So it introduces a, an unsureness into their mind that, that God is, you know, um, that all God is saying is, is truthful and that God's watching out for their best, um, what's where I can't think of the word you know, watching out for the, for their the betterment of their lives, I guess. So yeah. it, just, it introduces a, a whole, a question uh, yep. where there was no, I think no question before. Yeah. So what's he really making Eve think? Does God really want what's best for you? Does God really want what's best for you? Or is he holding something back? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. So we've got that. That's a major part. And there's one other major thing that the serpent is doing here in order to try to get Adam and Eve to sin. So one is to question God's goodwill. What's the other thing? Well, I think simply put, he's, he's creating doubt. He's creating mm -hmm. doubt in God's uh, perfect wisdom in his perfect. Uh, I had another word. Now it's gone. Unfortunately, um, it, just his perfect will for mm -hmm. them. So, yep. um, and he does that for us still today. It worked then. And unfortunately it has worked for 2000 some years or more than that. What am I? 2000, 10,000 years. Um, and so he's, 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 uh, he's created a, a chasm between Adam and Eve and God. Yeah. With yep. doubt. Yeah. Right. And doubt. Um, so we've got doubt in God's, uh, in God's goodwill towards us and the method through which that's going to happen. Is he's getting Adam, what's that Lena? Temptation. Okay. So, so the temp he's, he's yep. hitting an arrow right at where we're supposed to know the difference between right and wrong. And he's causing them to sort of question the basis of that by introducing, but through temptation, that's when that's nurturing the desire to want something that isn't good for you, that you shouldn't have, that yeah. you know you shouldn't have. Yep. What's, what's the direct temptation here? What's Adam, what's Eve being tempted um, towards? Uh, to have knowledge at, 
at the, well, A, doing something that they were told not to do, but to have something um, to be the same, uh, like to have knowledge at the level of God's. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that's what we've got directly stated in verse five there, right? You will be like God. You will be like God knowing good and evil. So you've got this direct temptation uh, to the heart of Eve saying, um, uh, you can be more than what God wants you to be. In fact, you can be on the level of God knowing good and evil with wisdom like God. Yeah. And the other big thing I'm just kind of really trying to hone in on here is the method is what? Did God really say? So what's Satan trying to get Eve to do? Doubt that she knows God's word, right? Or doubt that, um, that God's word is trustworthy. That when God speaks to us, that we can trust that he really is telling us what's good for us or what's true, right? And so at the heart, we've got these two things. One is you've got God's word being doubted from the very first. And then second to that, you've got then God's goodwill being doubted. Um, and the two of those go in tandem together and are bound together. Yeah, right? Uh, Pastor, I have a question here. Yeah, um, Liam. Would, would this be considered the actual introduction of evil into the world? I mean, before this, the world was perfect. Adam and Eve were in perfect unity with God. Um, there, there's, it seems to me there was, well, I guess there was Satan. So there was evil. Okay. never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, so what's interesting is any of these questions that we have all, all, all we have is a few chapters. So we just can go back and read it and kind of pull in a few other things from scripture because we just don't have the deepest, most complete answers to these types of things that we would want from scripture. What we can kind of logically sort of, you know, um, figure out here is, well, it seems like um, we're going to identify who this serpent is a little bit later, but it seems like whoever this serpent is, uh, there was already a kind of rebellion that took place before this, right? Uh, against God, because you've already got someone, something here setting him or itself up against God. But what we can say is that this is the introduction of evil, right? Uh, especially it's, it's directly labeled as knowing good and evil into humanity, right? That's, that's the account that we've got here. Yeah. So I would say there's kind of big four things to really kind of talk about here. Um, the serpent is attacking four big things. So the first is God's word, right? So that has not stopped. This is the thing that we struggle with. And when we say struggling with trusting God's word, we're not saying that somehow um, Christians are defending God's word and the rest of the world is attacking God's word and is motivated by Satan or something like that. No, we, with our fallen natures, we just on our own, we wouldn't need anyone else, right? There's no other human beings around. It's just even Adam here um, with Satan. Uh, we on our own struggle with trusting God's word all the time, don't we? When we go through hardships, uh, when we think God's holding back something from us, um, when we're just reading scripture on our own, this is a ever present struggle, even amidst the Christian church, right? Uh, second thing here, God's conception of morality. So what is good and evil? right? So the serpent is trying to get Adam and Eve to think that God's not really telling you what good and evil is and that God is actually doing something that's wrong here um, and that it's not bad for you to break God's law. And so you have all of these moral things that are arising right here in these few verses. Third one here, uh, this was brought up, right? We got the actual temptation, the tempting of Eve's pride and self-interest. And then we've got Eve's belief in God's goodwill. And so hopefully you can see all four of these things. They're introduced right away with Adam and Eve, and they are going to be with us, not only throughout the next uh, uh, 2000 years of, of, of revelation in scripture, uh, but they're going to be even up to the human race today. In fact, it's going to be something that we continue to struggle with all four of these things, but we find all of them introduced right here in Genesis chapter three. So talk about kind of worldview shaping, right? So with the very first few verses of Genesis three, we've got the foundation of, of our philosophy of evil, so to speak, and the greatest things that we as humans struggle with. So that's just the beginning first verses here. What time we got here? All right. 
Who is, though, this serpent that we're talking about? Maybe you've seen this picture before. It's a uh, famous, uh, I think it's a watercolor done by William Blake. William Blake was hired to do, you know, a hundred pictures of, of the Bible. And he's got a very famous series for the book of Revelation. And this was then used as, you know, a centerpiece image for things like um, Silence of the Lambs and Hannibal and stuff like that. Uh, it's the title of it is the great red dragon. And so in the book of revelation, you've got this event that takes place right in the middle of it. Revelation is one of these interesting books where, uh, so maybe just off the bat, it's, it's a book of prophecy or it's a vision book. It's, it's basically 20 chapters of God giving a vision to John and one of our first principles that we need to remember when it comes to any time we're talking about prophecy or vision, we can only know, we can only say we know for certain how to interpret prophecies or visions when God himself gives us the interpretation. So maybe think back to uh, Joseph or Daniel uh, when someone approaches uh, them with a prophecy or a vision or a dream or something like that. What does God do? But he gives the interpretation of that to the prophet. That's the only way we know for certain what's going on in these things. And so the strange thing with Revelation is we've got 20 chapters of vision, but we've got no extensive uh, interpretation of this dream given to us. So we have to be very careful, very careful about what we say we know and uh, what we're just kind of trying to surmise from it. And so in the vision, there's all these beasts and locusts and witnesses, and, and just about all of them are not identified. But there is at the center of the book, this dragon, and this dragon is directly identified. So who is the dragon in Revelation? So Revelation 12, 9 says, that great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. So um, what's, what can we pull out just from this one passage here? So the dragon is obviously Satan, but why is this important for us? And what we're studying right now in Genesis. The second clause who yep. leads the whole world astray. All right. So we've got that, which is deeply important, leads the whole world astray. So somehow this figure, Satan or the devil, uh, leads is involved with, with the whole world being separated from God. Uh, what else do we have? I think the continuity of seeing him at the beginning and the end. Yeah. Where do you see him in the beginning? Here in, in this the passage. What's he called? A dragon? The size of dragons? Yeah, right, the serpent. So he's called the ancient serpent, right? The ancient serpent. So what's this an allusion to? Um, the fact that this is a serpent that's been around from the beginning is somehow uh, uh, involved with humanity in general and humanity's falling away from God. So this Bible passage makes, it, we're going to see a few others, but strongly alludes to the idea that that serpent in the garden um, is Satan, right? Or the devil, right? This figure uh, that we find throughout the rest of scripture. Pastor, two yep. other things. Go ahead, Jim. You, yeah. you see that um, he is uh, the great dragon. So that would indicate that he's very powerful Yep. And, and was hurled down so that he was defeated. Yeah, that's huge. And so, yeah, we should probably mention this. The, the main theme of Revelation there's very little that we can say concretely about the, the stuff and the visions of Revelation, but there's one very clear message in Revelation, and that's evil loses good wins. <laughs> and a major part of that in the narrative that's told in Revelation is Satan being utterly defeated, the dragon being utterly cast down and taken care of, that in the end he loses completely. And, uh, and this is then the gospel then is the narrative of how that actually happened in history, right? How this Satan that began uh, an evil work at the beginning of time, uh, by the end of it, he is defeated utterly and completely. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, there's an awful lot, right? Just in that one sentence, isn't it pretty 
amazing. Uh, someone's got a hand raised. Ken, question? Yeah. Um, yeah. I can't read God's mind, but why, you wonder why God didn't go the whole way. If he hurled them out of heaven, he had the ability to destroy him. Obviously, he didn't destroy him because he still exists. Uh, just wondering the meaning behind that. Is that for God, so that God can, in, in essence, allow us with his pre-election, of course, to go to him, to demonstrate our, by choice, our willingness to go to him? I mean, clearly, God is capable of destroying evil. He mm -hmm. hurled them down. Why didn't he destroy them, put them away for good? Yeah. And so, and, uh, and no notice what you did there, Ken. So you started with, with the question of why didn't God just take care of Satan to begin with, right? And you end with um, really realizing what this is, what question this is really larger a part of, and that's the question of evil, right? Why does God allow any evil uh, such as someone like Satan to be able to do his work? Why not just take care of it once and for all? And um, what we don't have from scripture is like a comprehensive passage that says, this is why God allowed this specific thing to happen or that specific thing to happen. But you touched on some of the things that scripture talks about. Um, and when we're in the midst of suffering and evil, sometimes we don't want to hear the types of answers that scripture gives. But one of them is what you said there, Ken, uh, that God is able to, he's chosen to do this because this is how he has chosen to make his his uh, power and his wisdom known um, through the way that he deals with evil. Uh, other passages, right, talk about the idea that God works through the evil of suffering in this world, um, uh, that this is how he works for our good, right? Part of it is going to be bound up with some of the questions that we talked about last time, um, such as why does God, uh, so why does God, um, Oh, how did, how did we put this last, last week with Fran? Um, right. Why, why does God um, deal with sin and not just kind of destroy it all, especially the human race with all of our sins? Why not just take care of it once and for all? Um, and the answer to that scripture tells us is because God loves us and he doesn't want to be separated from us, but wants all who can to come to a knowledge of the truth, right? Desires that no one be lost. And so we've got all these different propositions that we can put together that aspects of the mind of God that he reveals to us. None of it's going to be comprehensive in the midst of our suffering. Um, uh, our sinful nature is not going to be happy with any of the answers. Um, but what we do know is that we do have a good God that when he created humans in his image and in that image, uh, they chose to disobey God out of his love and out of his mercy, um, he created uh, the whole gospel narrative, even before time, to meet our needs uh, as fallen children through this gospel, um, which we're going to see then the promises of exactly how he's going to respond to Adam and Eve and these first sins. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, John chapter eight here then. So this is Jesus speaking. And so Jesus is speaking to the Jewish people who rejected him. And Jesus has just said to them a couple verses before this, if you hold to my teaching, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Right? So that's what he's just saying to the Jewish people, this very exclusive statement. If you hold to my truth, the truth will set you free. And then uh, the Jewish people, probably some religious leaders uh, in the crowd, they responded, well, we're children of Abraham. We're already free. We don't need you to set us free. And Jesus' response to them is, uh, actually, guys, you're not children of Abraham. Maybe you think you are. Maybe you are in an ethnic sense, but you're not real children of is, is, uh, Abraham. Instead, and this is what Jesus says, and it seems incredibly harsh, but just listen to the way he speaks. He says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies, right? So just looking at this passage then, in what sense are the Jewish people that Jesus is speaking to, in what sense are they, they not children of Abraham? 
How are they children of the devil? Original sin. Yeah, so original sin. And what has that original sin led them to do? To turn away from God and the promise of a Savior. Um, they're totally ignoring what's been recorded throughout their history. That yeah. The Savior, the Messiah will come. Yeah, right. And Jesus' language here, the way he says this is, is they've turned away from the truth, right? They've turned away from the truth. They've rejected the truth in Christ as he's appeared here. And that's what ultimately makes them children of Satan, right? Is that they have rejected uh, the Messiah as he's appeared here. They have held on to the lies of Satan. Yeah. Um, why would Jesus say that Satan was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth? Was it not through him that death entered the world? Yeah, right. Or he was, he was a part of it, right? Um, when we look at who the culpability falls on, Scripture makes it very clear. It's both Satan's fault and Adam and Eve's fault corporately together. They all share the blame uh, in the fall. But uh, Satan is the instigator at the beginning. And in that sense, how is he the father of lies? We just saw he, he spoke the very first lie. Did God really say, right? Oh, no, God didn't say that, right? At the very beginning, uh, he became the father of, of, of lies in the twisting of God's word, right? Um, so all of these things packed to the beginning makes it very clear. Scripture looks back at that serpent in the garden and identifies that serpent as the devil. And that's all I'm really trying to get at here right now is that you notice the name devil, right? Uh, does not appear in Genesis chapter three. What we have is just simply the serpent. Well, who is it? The rest of scripture makes it, uh, makes it very clear who it is that we're talking about. So. Um, Pastor? Yeah, Fran. I'm stuck on something. I'm sorry, I can't get off it. Uh, when you went just one slide back, when you said that the serpent attacks God's word, his conception of morality, yep. and then you said Eve's pride and self-interest. Um, I don't know why, but I, I'm, I'm hearing the words that, uh, you know, Adam and Eve were made perfect and, and holy. And I've always interpreted that sin only came into their life once they succumbed to the devil's temptation. Yep. But that language of him playing on her pride, well, if she was prideful before the devil, the devil tempted her, isn't that already sin present in her? Uh, if we're defining pride as a sin. So, um, so if we're thinking of the idea of self-interest and pride as, as a sin, right? And what, what we have now and the way that you know, we reflect on those concepts now is we can't help but think of them in a sinful way, right? Um, but is there a healthy sense of self-interest? Yes. Yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, is there a healthy sense in pride as well? If by pride, what we mean is the fact that, that God designed human beings uh, to mirror his image. He, he created wonderful creations and we take pride in the sense of we're, we're proud of what God has created, right? Um, the bottom line being is, is I'm looking for some way of, of talking about the idea that um, why would Eve choose to believe in the lies of Satan, right? That's going to turn into these good things, these good motivations that Eve had uh, being twisted by Satan, right? Into something that they were never meant to be, right? Right. Um, God created something wonderful when he created Adam and Eve, right? And Adam and Eve probably knew that God created something wonderful when he created them. Um, but they weren't happy with just the status of what they were, right? Um, so he created wonderful, wonderful, but not perfect. Um, well, uh, <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean by that? Well, it's just the, the, the predisposition to let what would have been good attributes become the source of original sin seems less than perfection. Um, so, so you're saying that, that God could have created creatures with free wills, Adam and Eve had free wills that, um, that, uh, and, and, and part of that would be that there's no possible way that they, 
could have chosen sin. In which case it wouldn't have been free will. Yeah, right. So we run into a whole lot of problems here, right? Uh, when we're trying to yeah. kind of peel away the mind of God and yeah. the idea of what humanity is like in God's creation, right? Um, again, we've got three yeah, no, chapters It's just here. those words yeah. that we said that... Yep. I see what you mean, though. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm off. I just, kind of, yep. I just yep. got stuck on that for a second. Couldn't get going. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not trying to suggest that, that Adam and Eve uh, had the sin of pride <laughs> before the fall, right? But clearly, Satan is playing on some quality that they have, right, in their psychology um, uh, in order to bring about this temptation, right? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Pastor, Christine. Yeah, Chris, yep. That's a good question here. Do you, do you think the um, understanding Christ's temptation could help bring light to Adam and Eve temp Adam and Eve's temptation? Because yeah, why would you say that? Well, because he actually had to be tempted, and so we understand that that even though we can't maybe find the distinction between where pride turns into sin, we know that Christ actually is perfect, but yet he felt real temptation, and so there has to be. I mean, I don't know. I don't have the words to describe the distinction, like where it falls from, from perfectness into sin, yeah. but it certainly exists. Yep. Yeah. So that image of God, uh, a true sense of free will that can truly choose good that was lost with Adam and Eve. So we find in the chapters after Genesis, there's no longer that image with Christ. That's the first person then in history since Adam and Eve that has God's perfect image because he is God, right? but that perfect image in the sense of being perfectly holy and righteous. And yet he, yeah. Right. So we see him dealing with temptation, right? Um, if there was no possible way for him to fall, then I guess the idea of temptation would not make much sense. But again, we're kind of getting into this kind of weird uh, theoretical space that the Bible just does not have answers for. But I bet you, yeah, you're right that a long meditation on that, we would probably find a lot of very interesting ways that Christ's temptation helps, helps illuminate uh, the first temptation here. Yep. Yeah, good. Um, all right, I wanna move on then to the most important part because this is a Bible study on the gospel and we have not gotten to the gospel. <laughs> so John chapter three here, uh, as we continue, John chapter six, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, uh, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Uh, and so scripture makes it very clear here. Uh, the rest of the Bible here, we do not look back at Eve as somehow being like the one sole source of evil that somehow like the, the, the sex or gender woman is bad because that brought sin into the world. Um, no, Eve was there with, or Adam was there with her, right? Look at that language, was there with her, apparently doing nothing. Um, and so the two of them brought sin into this world and they're both held culpable of, of this sin entering into the world. So that's what we've got. Once they eat it, we, we need to kind of truncate the story a little bit here, but once they eat it, uh, it says that their eyes were open. They realized that they were naked. They go and they hide from God from that point forward. Up until this point, they're not hiding now they are hiding from God. And so God goes out and he finds them and he finds Adam and Eve. And he says to them, uh, have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And this is meant to, to sound the way that I just read it. So in Genesis chapter two, uh, Adam is, is writing love poems about his wife, right? He's praising God for this flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. Now, what's he doing? He's saying, God, you, you know, this woman you put here, she's the one that deceived me, right? So now we see how, uh, how, how Adam's mind, right, is now blaming someone else for this sin. Then the Lord said to the woman, what's this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. Now she points to the serpent, right? The serpent deceived me and I ate. So she shifts the blame as, blame as well. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, and now I'm just kind of skipping to, he says a lot of things to the serpent at this point, but here's the most important thing for our discussion. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman 
and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And if you're wondering why are we spending so much time on, you know, Revelation and John and, and the dragon and Satan, all this kind of stuff, this is why, because it's deeply important in order to understand what's being said here in this, the most important sentence uh, of the entire Old Testament right here. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And so just join me real quick in identifying all of the pronouns here. Who's God talking to? He's talking to the serpent. So the phrase, I will put enmity, who's the I? That's a God. So God will put enmity between you, who's the you? That's the serpent, right? I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, Eve. Between your offspring, in the Hebrew, this is in the plural, your offspring, so whose offspring? The serpent's offspring, and hers. And so what's hers? The offspring of Eve. But then in the Hebrew, something very interesting happens. All of a sudden, it goes from plural to singular. He will crush your head. Who's the he? Jesus. Don't go there yet, but you're right. Uh, who's the he? The offspring of Eve. Right now, we're back to the offspring of Eve. will crush your head. Who's your head? The serpent's head. And you, the serpent, will strike his, the offspring's heel. Okay? So, now... A lot of people look at this passage and they say, well, who are these offspring that we're talking about, right? Your offspring and hers. Um, I remember one time I was doing a uh, membership class. Um, I, had, I had this amazing opportunity to be uh, doing a membership class with this uh, professor from Kenya. And a uh, brilliant, brilliant guy. This was at the university, uh, Texas A&M University. And brilliant guy, but we were kind of going through this for the first time. And when we were reading this sentence, I asked him, so what do you think he talked, what do you think is being talked about here? And he said, well, back in Kenya, what we teach is this is why women are scared of snakes, <laughs> right? Uh, between your offspring and hers, right? God said that there's going to be this enmity between women and snakes. Uh, and I said, oh, I think there's more to it. I think there's more to it than that, right? So some people then look at this and they say, well, if Satan here is the serpent, then who are we talking about? The offspring of Satan, maybe uh, demons, right? So is this demons and hers, the offspring of Eve, the human race? So are we talking about demons and the human race or something like that? And I'm going to suggest that we've got an even greater interpretation than that. Now think back on what we were looking at from Revelation and from that John chapter eight passage. Who's the offspring? We're looking at the plurals now, right? Your offspring, plural, and her offspring, plural. Who's the offspring of Satan and who are the offspring of Eve? I'm gonna suggest that uh, it's between mankind or uh, human and evil and the evil spirit world. Okay. So the evil spirit world and humans. Okay. Other thoughts. Look back at that John eight passage, if you can. And how does Jesus describe the children of Satan? And who does he contrast that to? Okay, so we're the offspring of Satan. <laughs> yeah, right. So Jesus says the children of the serpent are those who have rejected the truth, right? And so what's the truth? Um, well, what do we have promised here? Let's go to the he right now. So there's the he will crush your head. So we're told something very special here. There's a promise that's being made here. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did God do about it? Uh, what's being promised. So look at that he again. The he, we know it's going to be a human, right? It's an offspring of Eve in some sense, right? So it's a human. It's a male, right? It's a male he. It's singular. It's not plural at this point. And it's someone that's going to be able to defeat the devil. 
So here, what we've got is God promising Adam and Eve that he's going to send someone that is going to, in some sense, crush the head of this serpent, will in some sense defeat uh, this, this person that from the rest of scripture, we can identify as the devil, crush his head, right? We look back at that John passage um, and we see the deeper reality. And this goes back to our worldview. What's the true kind of story that orients everything that's going on here? There's really kind of two groups. There's on the one hand, there's the children of the truth and there's the children of the father of lies, right? There's the children that know that uh, God is good, uh, that God uh, loves us and that God is sending someone, an offspring of Eve that is going to set things right. And then there's the children that reject that promise. There's the children of Satan, right? And it's not as if these two groups are exclusive as in you can't, you know, like, like uh, 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 one group can't become the other. Obviously they can. And the rest of scripture is going to be uh, the message of that. And who we are is going to be defined uh, by the rest of scripture is trying to bring people out of darkness and into the light, right? Trying to bring us who were once, right? Who We were just like everyone else, children of the darkness, right? Who were brought into the light. And that's going to be the story of history. But it begins here in Genesis chapter 15. So uh, the way then art, we've got a bunch of different artistic renderings uh, of this, ways that it's been expressed in history. Um, and at other times on the left there, uh, Chris Kale, a very interesting artist. So he's got Jesus crucifixion, what's going on at the bottom of the crucifixion, but you've got it, you've got a skull there with a serpent going through it, right? And so the idea here is you've got Jesus on the cross, crushing the head of the serpent, right? Undoing the work that took place there in the garden. A uh, more viscerally, uh, full of eyes, that one uh, artist, I think Chris Powers, you've got the way that he pictures it there, how the death of Christ crushes Satan's head. But in classical art, at least for the last, uh, well, for a long time, I think we can find some very ancient Christian artwork, uh, probably from the first couple of hundred years where we see, or at least maybe from, from uh, uh, maybe like the 500s, but pictures where at the very bottom of the crucifixion, just sometimes when you see classical works of art, just look at the bottom of the cross and see if you can find that skull down there. And one of the... Uh, interpretations of why there's a skull at the bottom of this cross. There's a couple others out there as well, but one of the interpretations is that skull is supposed to be Adam's skull and that uh, through the death of Christ, there is an overcoming the death that was brought into the world. Um, that death that was introduced in Genesis 3.15 um, by Satan. And so all of these are meant to be pictures of Christ overcoming what Satan brought into the world in Genesis three there. Um, but just kind of maybe link it up with, right, this powerful passage. This is from John's first letter. And he says just directly, the reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work, right? That is literally why uh, we have the whole story of salvation is to begin undoing what happened there in Genesis chapter three. And the rest of scripture then is gonna be an unfolding of how God is gonna keep this promise of sending a he, an offspring of Eve, that is gonna be crushing the head of Satan in some way, shape or form. Again, progressive revelation. So we got a very little bit here. Um, when we ask then, for example, this is a painting uh, of, of uh, Abel, who is the first person to be murdered, right? Murdered by his brother Cain. And that's Adam and Eve grieving over the very first murder. What's interesting in Hebrews chapter 11. So we're kind of told right off the bat that Abel was a believer. In some sense, God found him righteous. Uh, how? Hebrews tells us by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Christ did. Why? By faith, right? By faith, by trust in the truth. By faith, he was commended as righteous. And when God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. So even in the very first generation, uh, uh, Abel and Cain represent these two different families, so to speak. Uh, those that are children of the lies, so to speak, Cain and unbelief. Uh, and then Abel, children of the promise, who through faith were considered by Christ righteous or considered by God righteous. Now, what was Abel's faith in? All it was faith in 
It's the only thing that it could be faith in, as far as we know from scripture, is that one promise given to Adam and Eve. You will have a child and this child will crush Satan's head. And that trust in that promise was the faith that made them righteous in God's eyes. They didn't know what you and I know, that that faith, uh, what they were putting their trust in was this figure, you know, thousands of years later, whose name was going to be Jesus of Nazareth. And the reason he was going to die was to be, and knowing all this kind of technical ways of describing how he was, how he justified us from our sins through this sacrifice, this propitiation on the cross. They didn't have any of that. All they had was you guys sinned, right? Uh, you, you, sin has now been brought into this world, but trust me, I'm going to undo this. I'm going to undo this through one of your offspring and he's going to defeat Satan. And that was their gospel. God's going to build on that over time. But we see the gospel uh, being presented right there, a gospel that through faith saves people, through faith makes them righteous in God's eyes. So.